We all want to understand the black and white. We want to see things in, in, in such a clear vision that we can make a definitive answer as to, yes, I'm going to treat that lesion or I'm going to watch that lesion. The problem is sometimes there's a lot of gray zone in between. And if we don't use judgment and instinct as to what's going on, we may miss the point. You know, patients would tell us, you're going to teach me how to brush and floss? So I'm going to take what you're already doing and we're going to help you do it better. And they really appreciated that a whole bunch. And it really made a difference in the outcomes that we received, we were able to find with our patients. It really gelled. And patients would come back in on their regular recare visits and say, why didn't anybody ever tell us this before? And the key question is, is your mind full of all this information that you're not using? Or are you mindful of the information about you? And the reality here is that we can know so much and not be able to apply an iota of it. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienist, episode number 159. My name is Andrew. And this is Michelle. Hello. What's up, stranger? Yeah, I know. I'm back in the country. Yay. Yeah. How was your trip? It was great. It was great. I had some interesting things on the way back, but for the most part, it was very good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want our listeners thinking like I have any sort of emotion, but it does feel different when you're out of the country. I get, you're like so far away and I'm like, it's not three hours time difference anymore. It's like half a day time difference. And I want you to respond to my messaging quicker. And I only give you half the attention because I'm like, I'm doing 47 other things. <laughs> I can't yeah. I mean, it was like a, it was like a business trip. Like you actually had to not pay attention to me and I didn't, I didn't know how to process it. I, so know. I'm, I know. I'm not really that codependent. But, but we um, really are at this point. I'm sure really, the listeners probably know that we are very much like brother and sister at this point, And we probably talk to each other more than we talk to any other family members. You know what, though? We're like the brother and sister that's like on like the family, like the family TGIF sitcom that actually like each other most of the time. Most of the time. Because here's the thing. It's true. It's true. And despite our arguing and bickering on the podcast occasionally. Yeah. For the most part, we do get along. Yeah. Oh, the crazy relationships Facebook will create for you. I know. <laughs> it's, that's for sure. Well, should we, um, we, we promised our listeners that we would read a couple of things before we uh, jump into the interview. Yeah. And so I think that if, if it's okay with you, I'll jump in first and read the iTunes review. Okay. And then if you wanted to jump in and read the other, other little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this one is from Lauren. Lauren RDH. And this was uh, January 23rd, 2019, so somewhat recent, entitled Perfection in a Podcast, five stars. Hi, Michelle and Andrew. Just wanted to give you both a big thank you for continuing to deliver amazing content with humor and enthusiasm. (laughs) I love it when they take little pot shots at you for saying that, but it's not real. I mean, it was genuine and nice, but like, I just think it's so funny when they quote you. She says, I'm a hygienist who recently transitioned from private practice to public health environment. For the first time in five years of practicing hygiene, I am the solo hygienist at my workplace. Working as the only RDH in my office left me feeling less supported initially, but your podcast helps me to stay engaged, passionate, and current. And then Prince, she said, and I also feel a sense of connection and camaraderie after listening to each episode. Thank you for being supporters and advocates for our profession. You two are great. Keep up the amazing work. A little heart sign, Lauren. That just makes my heart leap. So great because I was the only hygienist too, and I know exactly where you're at. I know Mm -hmm. that feeling and not having the support because it is hard when you're like, What scaler do you use? I just had the hardest patient, and like no one else appreciates that, right? Right, (laughs) in the office. You you know, it'd be really nice. Lauren, if you'll uh, actually email us at um, a tale to hygienist at gmail.com, if you would actually help us with something, because I was thinking about this a lot, like this is something that we've never really talked about is making that transition, I guess, from, you know, private practice to public health. And maybe if you gave us like some pointers or keys that we can kind of pass on to the bigger audience, or even if you wanted to do like a voice memo, and then we can put it on the air for everyone else, or 
if you want to get <laughs> really crazy, we can maybe even do like a round table about this. But anyway, like I feel like neither Michelle and I are probably qualified enough to speak to this and it might not be enough for a whole episode, but if you wanted to let us know, that'd be really awesome. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. And so the message that I have is from a listener, Christy. She has, I love her engagement. She always sends little messages and has been for a while. And she brought up a really good point that we wanted to chat about. And she said, I've been listening to the four part airway episodes and I would like to comment on the statements made about hygienists who only take the classes their doctors pay for. I try to be responsible for my own CE. So this was a little offensive, although I do know that it is not the norm. One way that would help hygienists to be able to be responsible for their own CE would be when these courses are offered. If most hygienists are like me, I do not like to cancel appointments. Most CEs are during business hours and notice is given, you know, maybe a few weeks or to a month before. And she's scheduling her patients six months ahead. And I know most people have to ask for time off for those appointments. So thank you again. Love in the airway episodes. And that's a really good point and definitely I don't want to offend anybody either because we have all been in that boat where we don't want to take time off for the courses. For sure. So comment back on that one and let us know what you do for getting your CEs. And if you have to only go to these courses like a Hinman or your state meeting, because you know that they're like a year in advance you know, those dates, or if your office lets you do those kind of things, because that is a great point. And one that maybe you and I, well, I, of course, am just going to them because that's my job now. But I, I kind of agree. Like I do remember back four years ago when I didn't have a, I never hired a temp and that was hard to take off. But yeah, you know, for, I do though think, I guess that also depends on Fridays because most hygienists have off on Fridays usually, typically, I should say. And then a lot of the courses are on Fridays. Yeah, but what if, yeah, what if you have to leave Thursday yeah. from the West Coast because it's on the mm -hmm. East Coast and like you lose all the time and whatever, whatever, or it's a red eye and oh, yeah. you don't really want to be there that day. One other thing I thought about as we had talked about this previously was, look, n you might not always be able to get to the courses that you really, really want to, but there's nothing that's going to be stopping you from reaching out and saying, when will you have this course in a year or in six months or how, you know, whatever your time frame is to the actual person giving the, the lecture. And yeah. there's also the opportunity, I think, to maybe contact that person and ask them if they would entertain the idea of doing webinars because webinars are something that people don't really think about sometimes. And if there's a way that they have sponsors or whatever that could support them, then maybe doing a four part series as a webinar. There's lots of things you can do, but you might have to get the speaker to kind of come out of their shell a little bit. So that was a great suggestion, though. We appreciate your comments. We appreciate the feedback and always um, engage with us. I have one more. I have one oh. more because hold on. Well, I, I would say we get this next time, but then we'll probably forget. So we have one more thing that just came in yesterday, and this is from Tracy. She said, I'm really enjoying your series on airway. I want to let you know that my dentist, Dr. Hansford, has created a really great app. I just finished listening to Michelle discussing the difficulty in following up with communications with patients about information to share with them during their appointment. This app allows patients to see their photos, diagnosis, recommendations, and referral resources. It is also it also includes a home care section where I input recommendations. The name is Best Practices. It's going to have a makeover in the future, but has been a great communication tool for us. Only a patient of record who has given us consent has a link sent to them to access their information. Thanks for your great work. And then I asked her if we could read that on the air and she said, yes. So that's it's awesome. I'm going to take a look at that app too, because that sounds like it fixes a lot of issues. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, that was a really long intro to this amazing episode that we have with Dr. Kamisi. Yes. And this is going to be on minimally evasive minimally invasive <laughs> dentistry. And Dr. Kamisi is amazing. I have been harassing him for years. And now that he lives in my city, I go physically to his office at the medical university and harass him. He is a wealth of knowledge and has been doing things outside of the box for years. And I'm so excited that he is in my state teaching the dentist those very cool um, ways of treating patients that are a little bit different. So we hope that you enjoy this episode with Dr. John Comisi. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. 
Well, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So listeners, I am very excited to bring to you um, a dentist that actually I've known for a few years. And if you have not been lucky enough to attend his course or read any, read any of his articles, you're really going to love this interview. Welcome, Dr. John Camisi. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you this morning. It's great to have you. Um, so what's so funny about our relationship is that I met you years before ago, um, when I early on when I started working for Tefe, and you were in New York, correct? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I see on Facebook, he talks about Charleston. I was like, wait a second. Wait, wait, what are you doing in my town? (laughs) And living and working here now. (laughs) Yes. I'm so beyond lucky to have you in my backyard. And I actually go harass you with us sometimes at the medical university. (laughs) It's a pleasure when you come dropping by. It's just, you know, it just helps the day get that much nicer and brighter. So it's really (laughs) great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about you and your journey and um, some of the things that you're real passionate about. Well, I've got a very interesting life, and I'm really wonderful to be here with Andrew and yourself today. Uh, I was a private practice uh, general dentist in Ithaca, New York for 34 years. I had the opportunity of treating a lot of wonderful people over the course of that time. And over the course of my career, I got... I was asked to participate in education, writing articles, and started lecturing around the country and around the world now. And it's really an interesting world that we we live in. And suddenly I go from little old, good old USA town, small town USA to to coming here to Charleston. But it's been a very interesting evolution of things. Uh, Treating patients in in private practice was an amazing thing. So you get to learn all of the uh, the wonderful things of the family that they are, that they bring to your practice every day and the nuances and the challenges. And sometimes uh, they they teach you many lessons, (laughs) you you might think. (laughs) Just when you think you know it all, your patients teach you a little bit more. And if you're if you're smart, you listen to them because often they're on a tra- they're on a track that you might not think of on a professional basis, and suddenly go, duh! I didn't, why didn't I think of that? Uh, so I've been very very fortunate, and then uh, over the course of time, I've, I've consulted with so many wonderful companies like Tepe, just crazy good things over the course of time, and I've been lucky enough to to meet fabulous folks uh, like yourself, and and just teach, and and suddenly teaching is now my main trade. Being here at the Medical University of South Carolina uh, College of Dental Medicine and teaching my students uh, the practical mechanisms of dentistry that you may or may not get in an entire academic environment or an academic influence. So um, it's a, I've got some great students and great colleagues at the at the university that we're just trying to make a difference in the world of our patients and the world of our students as their next generation is being created. So it's really pretty fun. Well, how would you break down practical management? Like, what does that actually mean? Uh, something that sometimes I don't have, common sense. <laughs> That's, that is one of the things that I think most often is neglected in most of our practices and in our world. It's just thinking what makes sense as, as going on. Because we learn in dental school all of the various rules and procedures step by step by step on how to do things. But sometimes you forget why you do those procedures. And uh, the commonality that I try to bring across to my students is thinking what is going on and why you need to do what you're doing. It's it's an in, inherent genetic you know, in, in, uh, encoding that goes on over the course of time. And from a practical standpoint, you have to be able to take all of the science and all of the understanding and break it down to what's really going to work with that particular patient at that particular time. Otherwise, you you kind of you lose the the overall edge that you may otherwise have. So I try to instill in my students that even though you have an ideal circumstance that you need to you need you know you need to get to, sometimes ideal changes as you go along and suddenly that cavity preparation turns into the monster that you never knew was going to be there. Or that patient is not going to respond to the therapy that the manufacturers may tell you is going to happen by just, you know, following their direction. Sometimes their chemistry, their physiology just won't work. And you have to start to think independently and outside the box most of the time. So kind of lose the cookbook recipe 
form of dentistry and right. use your critical thinking cap. <laughs> exactly. Because great chefs don't follow a recipe. They know the ingredients and then they they uh, modify it as necessary for the situation that they're dealing with. And that's what I like to do. I like to have multiple things in my arsenal, but I don't have to use them all. Or I may use one aspect a little bit differently this time versus another time. So having all of the ingredients is what you really need to have. And so that's a great analogy. I love that one, that one, Michelle. I do too. I do too. So you actually just wrote an article recently on minimally invasive dentistry. Yeah. And so we do have a lot of dental hygiene students. We have new grads and we, we got lots of veterans. So they could be practicing this without even realizing it. So can we break down what that is? Sure. And what that looks like? Sure. I'll do the best I can. You know, we are in the dental profession. We are all very, uh, we all want to understand the black and white. We want to see things in, in, in such a clear vision that we can make a definitive answer as to, yes, I'm going to treat that lesion or I'm going to watch that lesion. The problem is sometimes a lot of gray zone in between. And if we don't use judgment and instinct as to what's going on, we may miss the point. So, in the, in the piece that I wrote for Dental Product Shopper, we, we were talking about, you know, using technology to make a definitive answer as to what's going on. But not everybody has the technologies necessary to be able to make that definitive diagnosis. And sometimes we have to look at things differently and employ various uh, mechanisms such as minimally invasive procedures, uh, such as good remineralization processes in, in the oral cavity, giving them the things that are going to neutralize the mouth because patients have an acidic mouth and they may not even know it. And then they go ahead and they, they continue. We, they, we tell our patients to brush and floss all the time, but maybe they don't really know how to do that because no one ever showed them. They basically uh, go ahead and do it to the best of their ability. And then we can keep on criticizing them and saying, no, no, you got to brush and floss. You got to brush and floss, but they get frustrated with us. So maybe if we stopped and actually showed them what to do. As I shared with you earlier, Michelle, if I were able to switch my golf game and my bowling game scores, I'd be excellent in both of them, but you know, uh, 240 on the golf course and 69 <laughs> on the bowling alley just doesn't cut it. Uh, you know, I'm a lean, mean divot machine and I'm a bumper bowling fanatic because I can't otherwise do it. But if I ever took lessons and were shown how to do that, I could be really well in both of them. And that's what we do with our patients. We tell them what to do, but what they understand and what they are able to employ may not be the same thing. So if we were actually able to create a protocol in which we sat with our patients and actually instructed them on what to do, they might be able to better grasp what we're asking them to do. Giving them a toothbrush, sending them off to the bathroom, and then having them come back into your treatment room and disclosing and showing them this is where you missed. Let's work together to see how we can improve this by just enabling them, not berating them as we have, unfortunately have a great tendency to do. And we established that in my private practice. We did that with our patients. We took every new patient that we saw in our existing patients over the course of time and helped them understand why and how they could enhance their the overall well-being of themselves by just tweaking what they do every day. We, you know, patients would tell us, you're going to teach me how to brush and floss? So I'm going to take what you're already doing and we're going to help you do it better. And they really appreciated that a whole bunch. And it really made a difference in the outcomes that we received, we were able to find with our patients. It really gelled. And patients would come back in on their regular recare visits and say, why didn't anybody ever tell us this before? And I ex explained, I don't know, but I'm glad we were here to share, share with you how to do this now. So that was really a, an, an integral part. Getting the plaque, getting the debris out of the area to stop the acid attack is job one. And if we can do that as a team in our offices, we can create marvelous outcomes. And you and I could talk about that topic all day, every day. And we have. <laughs> and we have. We've spent many a lunch hour talking about that. Yeah, exactly. So if I, I want to kind of go back to um, the technology that you talked about to identify lesions, early lesions and things like that. And Andrew and I are both really kind of like learning the technology ourselves. You know, we did a wonderful podcast on scanners and scanner technology. So what other 
technology, and especially if our students are leaving and graduating and going into the offices, like when someone says diagnodent and they don't just like look at like, did you just say a German word? Like, what did you just say to me? You did actually, but <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there's so many different and fabulous instruments out there nowadays that you can uh, uh, purchase and employ at your office. But the key is not just going ahead and buying a toy and letting it sit and collect dust because you didn't learn how to do it properly. There's Diagonet, which uses a laser light to try to de determine what kind of breakdown that there may be within a crevice or a, a, a pit in a fissure, which which is very, very effective. But again, you have to clean the tooth out properly in order for that laser to really make sure that there's actual demineralization and not just a whole bunch of bacteria and food trapped in a pit. That's one of the challenges there. There's carry view, which is what I like to call translumination on steroids, because it's got this great camera along with some lighting that you can put on both sides of the tooth to show where the shadowing is going on. Translumination is one of the better ways of, of trying to er determine early lesions. In fact, on the state, on the national boards, they're using translumination to identify if there's an open contact for the students as they're taking the boards nowadays to see if there's actually a lesion going on before they allow the patient to be treated by the students going through their boards nowadays. So there's a lot of interesting things with light. And I love that aspect. Uh, there's carry, Canary System, which is an incredible system uh, that uses something called PTL Loom to identify a, a lesion, a real demineralization in a quantifiable manner, five millimeters deep into the tooth. But unfortunately, only one millimeter wide. So it's kind of got, you have to be very, very uh, specific and very, very skilled at working with that. It can be done. I've done it, but it is very, very uh, labor intensive. So it's a wonderful confirmation of things. So those are some of the quick technologies uh, on the on the threshold. Eventually, there should be and there will be an ultrasonic mechanism that will be able to look at teeth ultrasonically to see where lesions are and where cracks are developing. So that's coming soon to the market, if my understanding is correct. So there's a lot of really cool things that we're using. Digital radiography is, of course, excellent, but remember on a digital image, you may only be seeing 50% of what the actual damage is going on and uh, going on in there. So using some of the other tools like translumination with digital radiography, it can be a really great way to do things. That's interesting. And so if you, if you're doing these techniques, is there a charge for this? Um, or is there a CDT code or because I, I feel like that's not always the argument, like, okay, I'm going to go spend this much, but then how do I make that? How is that? Where's the ROI on that? Yeah, and, and we will, as time progresses, we will need to give a definitive diagnosis of a lesion before it is treated. So there are CDT codes that can help with that nowadays. Uh, maybe more need to be developed to be more specific as we go forward. But, you know, risk carries risk uh, circumstances. That's an important mechanism nowadays before you treat. We're going to need to uh, to have a carries risk assessment done on our patients. So understanding and incorporating that. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things that are going on. And Patty DeGangi and, and her group are working on codes to try to implement and get better CDT codes out there. And so we're, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. And I work with her on a periodic basis and she's amazing. Uh, I just can't get over what she's trying to do to improve the way that we take care of and treat our patients. So it's a wonderful thing. I love it. Yeah. And you've heard Patty on the podcast before. Um, and you should go back if you haven't listened to that episode, check that out. It's all it's in our early days, so you might have to go way back. <laughs> we do need to get her back on though. I mean honestly. Oh yeah. Her new material, new information will just blow you blow you away. She's awesome. Just an awesome speaker and incredible force in dentistry. So we use the technology and we identify a lesion. Is it gonna tell you is uh, like this a little baby initial lesion or like, how, are you able to then say it gave me this reading, so I should do this? Or is this when that critical thinking needs to come into play? 
If you're lucky enough to have a canary system in your office, you will get a definitive reading that will be able to tell you exactly how, what kind of demineralization is going on in there and whether or not treatment is rend needs to be rendered or not. So that's a really important thing. But not all of us are able to have that wonderful piece of equipment in our office. Uh, sometimes it's a very subjective mechanism that you and I have to use. Again, it's, a lot depends on the caries risk of that particular patient. If there are high caries risk, chances are all the demineralization aspect that you're going to, uh, treatments that you're going to render may not be as effective as you need to. If they're low caries risk, demineral, remineralization process using something like basic bites or uh, any product with a good fluoride in it on a regular basis, those are going to be helpful. Even a great probiotic like Probiora is um, a probiotic that I personally use on a daily basis is a great way to help your patients rebalance that, that bacteria colony formation in the mouth. But you really need to make sure that the patient is able to, A, be able to incorporate what you're suggesting. If they're going to give you lip service and they're not going to use it, then you're, yeah, it's kind of a waste of time. But if they are, if they, if you taught them how to take care of themselves and then you incorporate these various remineralization products that are out there, you can make a difference. And then you'll be able to monitor them routinely and see if, things have progressed and see how things are, are, are moving. Uh, annual radiographs may be necessary in that region, you know, to just to see what's going on, see if there's been any uh, additional progression. But it's really important to try to balance that oral environment and get the acidity under control in my mind. And if you can do that, then, you know, brushing with baking soda. What a great way to cause an acidic basis to, to just be reduced completely. It's simple. It's inexpensive. It's very straightforward. Understanding the intake of the various acidic beverages, including the potential of certain waters <laughs> that we know have a higher acidity than we'd like it to be. You know, Dasani and Aquafina, wonderful brands, great water. You find it everywhere. Unfortunately, pH can be around 5.5 and it's like, eh, do you really want your patient who's highly susceptible to be drinking that type of water all the time? Uh, maybe a more neutral basic water like Fiji or something like that might be a better way to go because it's got great minerals in that particular brand of water as well. So, doctor, there's a, an assessment that's being done with technology, and there's I'm sure some of our listeners are going to be those anti-technology people who are going to say, yes, but you have to be calibrated to whatever the technology is, and the te technology could be wrong. So what are some ideas for these types of people to make sure that they are understanding how to use it and how to interpret the data that's coming out of the technology? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, for the Canary system in particular, and, and Steve Abrams is a good friend of mine, it's a marvelous system because it's really going to be able to give you a number as to whether or not there is demineralization or cavitation going on to a great extent. And his system has also been shown in research studies to show you when remineralization has occurred. So because you get a definitive canary number, you will be able to see if that number improves over the time with remineralization processes. And Steve, Steve and his team have shown that time and time again in many research papers. Every other technology is kind of subjective. The carry view and the other transilluminations show you that there's something occurring, but it doesn't necessarily quantify it in the way that you, you and I would like to be able to say, ah, ha ha, there's something really there and that needs to be treated. These are all suspicious areas that need further investigating from various other mechanisms and in uh, observations to, to see if those need to go into and how long, you know, how many cavities, how many restorations does this particular, particular patient have? If they're, again, yeah, they never had a, a carious lesion before and there's something suspicious, you're going to go in and take that out operatively? No, I don't think so. I think I'm going to observe that. I'm going to put them on a remineralization basis. I'm not, I'm not drill happy. I don't want to create surgery on healthy structure uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. And we do that assessment at the school all the time. Do we really need to invade that tooth? Do we really need to cut on some really healthy structures? Just because we see something that looks interesting. Let's monitor this carefully and determine if there is a process that needs to be gone to. Do we need to just put them on something that will help them out? Give them an MI paste, give them a Prevident 5000, do something like that that can be really helpful. 
or for those people who are uh, have a calcium allergy, go with the uh, Remin Pro from Voco. You know, there's there are these things. So you have to be aware of the allergies your patients have too when you're using some of these products um, because of the uh, calcium, dairy, uh, and uh, sensitivities and allergies that are out there. That's where MI Pace gets a little bit kind of sketchy to work with. Then you need to go with something like Remin Pro. And you're smiling, Andrew, I know. You're saying, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so can you tell me, with the canary system, you talked about it measures the demineralization. Is this a depth or is it a density? Like, What are they measuring exactly? They're actually measuring the crystalline structure support if there is a demin going on in there. So it's, it's a very interesting product. I recommend uh, the listeners take another look at it because it's fascinating. Again, it, it is technique sensitive as to how you're aiming the beam of the tip. But when you find a lesion and you can quantify and you can verify that lesion spot over and over again, you're actually going to know if that lesion is progressing or remineralizing. That is the interesting part with it. And especially on class five lesions or cervical lesions, very easy to access. You're able to see if your remineralization process is working beneficially with the canary system. And we have, we have seen that happen uh, in our office. Class one, class twos are a little bit more challenging, but it, it can show you where there's a problem. It's, in fact, canary is the only system that you can put on, at or around a, a silver filling to see if it's failing effectively because it will measure and uh, you can actually see through a composite to see if the under stru underlying structure of your class one or class twos are actually uh, intact anymore. It is, a, it is an amazing science that, that Stephen came up with there. So kudos to him on that. It's kind of like blood work for the teeth. Kind of. It's a, not a bad analogy there. Yeah, sure. Because, and I only say this because I am, I just found out I'm so deficient in D3, but I had to get blood work and then I'll take my supplements and then I'll go back and say, see if I actually, and it's, so it's kind of the same thing. Like you see if the structure is demineralizing or demineralized, throw in your, a, uh, your medicament of nature of, 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 of choice. Right. Mm -hmm. And then try again and measure it again and see if there's any change. I love that idea. Yeah. And, it, and it's really been very helpful. Yeah, because I think, you know, as much as we are always asking people to like, remember, we're a part of the body, like the mouth matters. I think in the same vein, we are real quick to do surgery on teeth as if it's not a body part. Yeah. And it is a body part and it, and it, it is and yeah. it feels and it senses. I was explaining to my students yesterday in our in our operative classes, you know, everything that we do causes an effect on the overall ability of that structure to tolerate the next thing that we do to it. So you just don't want to indiscriminately remove structure for the sake of removing tooth structure. It's, it, it's not granite. It's living, breathing tissue that is responding to every stimulus that we put into it. And it can heal just like any other part of the body if we give it the nutrients and the availability to be to, to actually heal itself. And that's where good, healthy saliva is so important. If you've got a dry mouth situation going on with your patient, you're never going to solve the problem. Those teeth are going to just dissolve on their own. Kim Cooch said that many years ago in several pieces that he's written. You know, sal saliva is imperative. If you don't have a good salivary flow, how are you going to get good mineralization? So we need to look at that. Brian Novi, a few years back, my good buddy, showed me a really easy technique to essentially determine if there's a salivary problem with your patient. You invert the lower lip and dry it off with a two by two gauze, put a piece of tissue paper on the lower lip, let it sit for about a minute. After a minute, if it doesn't look like it's got some the moisture spots on it, you've got a patient with dry mouth. So that could be the causality of the problems for your patient. And then you know how you need to manage them. Then you put them on basic bites twice a day. You, you, you give them an artificial saliva or a moisturizing product like biotin or something like that on a daily basis. Then you can actually help your patient with dry mouth conversing with the physician regarding the medications that they're all on that are creating the dry mouth situation and see if some modifications can be done for your patient. This is all part of the chef hat that we wear in dentistry. I think we should do that for our next Facebook Live, Andrew, is see how quickly our mouth will wet the tissue paper. 
I think that'd be actually really fun. Our friends at uh, Tooth or Dare and see if they'll play along. <laughs> yeah, I, I use that. I use that slide. I use two slides in my in, my, in many of my presentations to describe that. And one of them is from Brian, in which shows what a healthy mouth looks like. And one of them is from one of my own patients, which we uncovered at a regular recare visit because she was getting frustrated that things were going downhill. Yeah. So I said, something's going on. Let's look at this more closely. And I just did that. And we were all amazed at no moisture on that lower lip. It was, it was a key factor and a turning point on how we were able to help that patient become healthier. That's so cool. So what I hear though, in your message is a lot of we can't go doing surgery, cutting teeth and doing periodontal treatment unless we involve the patient and engage them in their own therapy. And again, we, we want to be taken serious as a profession and treated as if we are medical providers. But a lot of times um, when I ask people, like if a, a cardiologist was doing a double bypass on somebody, you think they wouldn't talk about diet and exercise and um, blood pressure, medicate, all those things. But we, we tend to do that where we were like, we're just going to do these fillings, you know, keep rushing and that's it. And that's where we, and then every it. year or two, those fillings are replaced over and over again because nothing has changed. So again, getting the patient actively involved and doing something that theoretically our title of doctor indicates, which is teacher. If we can teach our patients and our staff members to help teach our patients how to manage things, they're going to be healthier in the long run. We would do that. Again, we would take our patients and we would put them through anywhere between two to four, one hour, hands-on, one-on-ones to help them go through and figure out how to help improve their oral hygiene at home. And patients would say, you know, you're going to do this? And I said, yes, of course. And you're going to charge me for it? And I said, yeah. That's my time. That's our skill. That's our knowledge. Yes. You know, that's what we're going to help you. And they said, well, you know, what if it doesn't work? I said, I'll tell you what, if it at the end of our sessions, it doesn't work for you and you feel you got nothing out of this and no improvement, I will buy dinner for you and 10 of your closest friends at the most expensive restaurant in <laughs> our community. And over the time period that we've done that, I never lost the bet. <laughs> so confidently, I can tell you that if you put your money where your mouth is, quote unquote, in this situation, mm -hmm. you can save a heck of a lot of money because you won't have your mouth attacked on a regular basis. And if we as healthcare professionals, oral healthcare professionals, will teach our patients how to take care of themselves, they may actually succeed. Oh, my goodness. But then we'll put ourselves out of business. No. Because we were busier because we taught our patients and they referred people to us time and time again, who we got healthier, we re rehabbed their oral cavity, we did whatever dental work that we needed to do, phase one, phase two, et cetera, and so forth. And then they brought more patients to us. So we never had a busyness problem. We never parred with an insurance company in the 34 years of my private practice. We were fee for service. We weren't the cheapest offer in the darn community. We weren't the most expensive, but we provided value to our patients that were willing to pay out of pocket for the things and the procedures and the overall education that we were able to provide for them. You can do it too, if you're listening out there. It takes guts. We, I want to personally thank the hygienist that taught us how to do that in the first place. Her name was Lori Dickman. She was an incredible addition to our team. She came to us at a really miraculous time period, showed us how she had handled things at her previous office before she came to Ithaca with her husband, Mark, because he was going to grad school at Cornell. And she educated us on how to do this. And because of Lori and her great insight, we created the process that continued for the next 20 plus years after that time period. So it was an amazing uh 
fortuitous situation for us. So thank you, Lori, wherever you are nowadays. Aw, mm-hmm. wouldn't it be great if she was listening? Everyone. She might, we, we stay in touch with her. We, we, shake, we exchange Christmas cards on a regular basis. She's, <laughs> she's got a great family. Her kids are growing up now. That's impossible. But, you know, it's just mm-hmm. one of those things. And, we, you know, I've been just blessed to meet great people that were a heck of a lot smarter than I ever was. And I learned from them and incorporated their brilliance into what we try to do and share with folks. And that's what I try to do every day at, at school. And that's what I try to do every time that I present in front of an audience, wherever I happen to be. So, Doctor, if I could just be so blunt, if it's this easy, why aren't more of us doing this? Drop the mic. <laughs> there is my, my wife, Karen, posted something on Facebook the other day. Who's a hygienist, by the way? No, she's a dental assistant. She's a licensed dental oh, assistant. Oh, is she? And she was in charge of our oral hygiene uh, education process. So, yeah, she, she's amazing. She, she she has more more knowledge than I'll ever have in so many things. But she put up the word mindful, and the key question is: Is your mind full of all this information that you're not using, or are you mindful of the information about you? And the reality here is that we can know so much and not be able to apply an iota of it. Or we can be aware of what's going on and realize that the things that we're doing is not, are not working. So why do other colleagues not do this? I can't answer that. Maybe they have a mind full and are not mindful of what they can be doing for their patients. Mm-hmm. So if you said that you were not the most expensive office, but you weren't the least expensive, Correct. how can, let's say, an office or a hygienist that's um, maybe in a public health setting or working in a demographic or a, a community where maybe their socioeconomic status is uh, lower, how can we integrate this idea and this philosophy and type of way of practicing in those environments when um, maybe sometimes they are required or reliant on government assistance as a dental office or very insurance based. Well, one of my friends actually used a sliding scale as a mechanism of doing things based on the income uh, and the needs of the individual. So you know, that could be a, a mechanism of employment into this, basically trying to provide a service that can be rendered based on the economic ability of that patient. Because the chances are is that you'll reach them and they'll be able to reach others in their same s- s- circle that need help that otherwise would be falling down and being lost. So we have to find a way of balancing this in some way. Uh, I, I don't have all the answers, but I know that everybody should be treated fairly and equally to the best of our ability. And we never turned a patient away because they couldn't pay. Um, we worked with them to make their possibilities of health be achieved. You know, we did that a lot. We didn't promote it and, you know, and bandy it about or, or self, you know, you know, bound on our chest like what we're doing. We did it because it was the right thing to do. And again, I know there are a lot of colleagues out there who also do that uh, on, on a basis and they don't promote it or share it. Uh, there's a lot of folks who do doctors, doctors with a heart kind of situation, which is an absolutely wonderful thing. There's so many of us who participate in the mom projects across the country, donating uh, our time and our, our services to patients who otherwise wouldn't be, be, be served. But I think as a whole and a profession, we just have to find a way to uh, balance the necessity to pay our own bills with the service that we share with the patients that we treat. Because if we can't pay our bills to stay in business, then how are we going to serve those that need us? So there is a, it's a really tough balance, but it can be done. And that's what we personally did in our office. And again, one of my friends says one time when I was listening to me lecture, he really doesn't do that, does he? He's going to go out of business. And Karen turned to him and says, we do it every day and we're not out of business. And so that, you know, the whole reality here is, is that you can do the right thing. You just have to find the way to achieve it. And if more of us do it on a greater scale, the more people will be able to help. So, you know, again, we, we need to pay our bills. We need to feed our families, but we also need to try to give back where we possibly can. And so many folks do, and you guys, I know you do, and I'm grateful to that. And I guess being a professor at a school, 
I'm kind of giving back in that capacity. Yeah. Too. But <laughs> yeah. Certainly, I took a pay cut <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to, to teach at the university, uh, which is certainly different from my private practice. But every day it's worthwhile uh, being with these young people and sharing with them my personal insanity so that this way they can hopefully <laughs> breed it as they go forward and, and help other people uh, to a higher degree as we go forward. So uh, there's no good answer other than doing the best that you can given the, the, the situation that we're out there. We treated Medicaid patients. Some of them couldn't pay my fee, so we we'd go on the Medicaid fee, and sometimes Medicaid wouldn't pay the fee. We'd still take care of them because they were ours. And I'm sure there are so many, many, many thousands of offices around the country that are doing that too. So dentistry is a very generous profession. We give a lot. Uh, it's just that sometimes the media forgets to explain that we're, we're not the drill fill money grubbing pigs that they sometimes make us out to be. <laughs> uh, you know, we do, we do take care of folks and there's a lot of investment that these young people put yeah. into their degrees nowadays in both hygiene school and in dental school. You know, it's a, it's a long, expensive road to go out and take care of the wonderful people that we have the pleasure of taking care of over the course of time. So one of those things. So true. And, you know, we're all very appreciative of your insanity because <laughs> it helps us. <laughs> it helps us be better clinicians. So when you talk about your two to four, one hour home care, hands-on sessions. What did that actually look like though? Was that before scaling and root planing? Was that instead of a profi, like did people come back and get their teeth uh, quote unquote cleaned? Our, our protocol was really easy. It, okay. It's, it's a really simple protocol. Uh, patients would present to our office as a new patient. Uh, we would go through our complete diagnostic workup with our hygienists and assistants and myself. Uh, they would schedule a longer appointment, probably an hour and a half or so, in which all of our records would be taken, ready graphs, uh, photographs, periodontal charting, oral cancer screening, airway uh, evaluation uh, at that one visit. I would be involved at the last part of the appointment just to verify all of the readings to introduce myself to the patients and to tell them that what I'm going to next do is next visit, we're going to have a, a consultation, which is complimentary. It's all no additional cost to them. And we were going to sit down and explain what I discovered and how I thought best we could take care of them. After we did that consultation and helped their patients become part of the solution, by helping them recognize what we were needed to do with them. We then would scale, schedule them for any emergency dental procedures that needed to be done, uh, fixing teeth that were bit, broken or hurting or whatever. And then we would schedule them for oral, uh, oral hygiene instructions. There would be between two to four visits before we cleaned their teeth, before we did replanning and scaling, et cetera, and so forth. Because if you don't have a diagnosis of periodontal disease or no periodontal disease before time, how do you treat? How do you clean their teeth? Are you not necessarily missing somewhere in there? So we would make sure that we had a diagnosis first. So we had a diagnosis, and if they were the, they were either green patients, green dot patients, or red dot patients. Green dot patients went immediately into profi situation and maintenance and recare after we got them healthy by teaching them their own oral hygiene uh, needs that were there. And then the red dot patients were those patients that we put through a periodontal protocol, education, gross debridement, replaning and scaling, reassessing every three months, et cetera, and so forth. So just depended on their particular direction that we needed to do. But we got them educated because if you don't teach them how to take care of the, the garden before you go in and do gum gardening, you're going to have a mess all over again. So to my periodontal colleagues out there, sorry, that's <laughs> just a, a little bit of a term that you all know that we all use it back and forth. But the reality is, is that we do have to help our patients keep it clean. Because if you do replaning and scaling and they don't know how to take care of it, how soon are they going to need RPS again? Pretty darn mm -hmm. quick. Are you not defeating the whole purpose of what you're doing? So after we did that, we go through replaning and scaling. We try to get that done within a two-week period of time. Within a week of the first scaling, we try to finish the second half of the mouth and get that done. Then bring them back in. Reassess the situation. Modify whatever they needed to do from their own oral home care because they might have fallen off the wagon a little bit. You know, they may have modified it in their own mind how they should be doing it. And we got to put them back on track again. So we did that with them. And that would happen every recare visit. We would evaluate, we would disclose, we would check to see where they were making it work, where their periodontal probings were improving, where their bleedings upon probing were. 
they became very interested. How are my numbers? How are my bleeding points? They became part of the solution. Yeah. They owned their disease and they weren't determined to manage it. It's amazing how many times patients would come in and confess. I felt like father <laughs> confessor. I was giving them the absolution every time. Uh, you know, here you go. God bless me, John, for I have sinned. I have not brushed my teeth for, for three days or something like that. I'm like, listen, <laughs> take it easy. You're okay. We're all human. We fall off the wagon every once in a while. We're here to help encourage you to get back on track with yourself again. So there was no bad mouthing, no beating the brow. We, we, we just laugh and say, God, you know, we understand. It was the holidays. You had a tough time. There were exams. The kids were driving you crazy. Your husband yeah, was your just... Your in-laws you know, were in town. Uh, <laughs> all these kinds of... So you work with them and you help them regain their initiative and their incentive. And you make them, again, part of the solution. And suddenly we, we had miraculous things occur, like success. And it was, did we succeed with 100% of our patients? No, there were always those who refused to do what they wanted to do. But we at least had a baseline of where they were, where they could have been if they had done something with it. And when they continued to fail, we could continue to say, will you be interested in moving in this direction? We can help you if you would like to. And if they didn't want to do it, we make the notations in the chart. We'd continue to encourage them to do more. If we would, if they'd let us help them, we would, and we go from there. You know, you just not everybody's ready at a particular point in time. They always, yeah. you have to help them get there. It takes ten no's to get a yes in sales. It takes at least a hundred no's sometimes <laughs> to get a yes in dentistry. It seems so. It's just one of the realities of it. It kind of is true. So just to kind of a complete, I want to do two things. Um, one, I have two questions for you, and then I just want to wrap up what this looks like for a minimally invasive treatment. Sure. Andrew, did you have anything you wanted to add in? No, it sounds good so okay. far. So I'm curious, when you have those patients that say, what do you mean you're going to teach me how to brush my teeth? Dude, I'm 45. Like, get out of my face. Like, I know what I'm doing. Or they're like, I'm I, just clean my teeth. I didn't come here for this. Like, I, I just came in for a cleaning appointment, right? Yeah. I just want to get my Polish teeth. Them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. exactly. So how do you approach, how do you tackle that with your patient population? We were very, very, very frank with them when they would make an appointment to come in to see us. We would explain we just don't clean teeth. We are here to provide a solution to your oral health needs, and we're going to do a complete comprehensive analysis of where things are, explain to you what is going on and what directions you might be able to travel if you wish to take care of things. But we just don't treat teeth. We, we, you know, we just don't clean teeth. We don't do that. There's no such thing. We're going to evaluate. We're going to see what the health of your bone is. We're going to see what kind of cavities you might or might not have, what fillings are in, are in good shape and aren't in good shape. We're going to look at your oral cancer. We're going to make sure that there's no, nothing noticeable as far as an oral cancer lesion. We're going to look at your airway to see if there's any signs and symptoms of potentially having simply breathing relating uh, problems going on. We're going to look at the alignment of your teeth to see whether or not orthodontics might be indicated. So we told them we don't do that. If you're looking for someone to clean the teeth, the guy around the corner, <laughs> he can probably do that for you. And we were not afraid, kind of like Santa Claus in the Miracle on 34th Street, sending them to Bloomingdale's. <laughs> it was okay with me. <laughs> I didn't have a problem with that. Because when you're in private practice, you have to be in private practice to enjoy your practice. And you have the right of refusal. You do not have to take care of every patient that walks through your door, as long as you don't touch them. <laughs> so if we, if they didn't, if they didn't agree with what we wanted to do from the get go, then we were not the office for them. Mm. And then they could go find somebody that's more in line with their thinking and philosophy. If if it was if it was incongruent, it wasn't going to work. And we were very frank about it. You know, again, we don't we don't participate with insurance. We didn't do anything. We'll help file insurance if necessary, but that's about it. So the bottom line is that in my office, they had to meet my criteria in order to become a patient. And we had to meet theirs in order for them to feel comfortable with us. So, you know, it's a two-way street, and I was not the only doc in my community. There were at least 40 other general dentists that they could go and see. And by all means, please be my guest. Yeah. And if you're looking for something different at a later date that you want to maybe take it to the next level of health, 
we'll be here for you. Just come on back. Yeah. You know, our door is always open to you, but you got to work with me in my way of doing things, if you'd be so kind. So that's, that's one of the issues there. Yeah. Not everybody wants, you know, what I had to offer. Nobody, not everybody is on that arena, that level yet. They're, they're not ready. And so if they're not ready, then don't try to bring them to where they're not ready to go to. I love that. And if I can wrap up what we're, what we've been kind of talking about, one, we're going to use the technology, right? Mm -hmm. And giving Riemann protocols, like basic bites and um, looking at their camera and their carries risk assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. And then following up with some real good teaching some education and making sure that they can be the keepers of their own oral health when they're not in our chair. Any other aspects to minimally invasive dentistry that we didn't dabble on or touch on today? I think that one of the most, yeah, and maybe to just sum it all up, the most critical thing that we can do is understanding what the needs are of the patient and looking for what the causalities are of the problems that they may present with. If we don't look at the acidity of the oral cavity, if we don't look at the mechanism by which they're taking care of removing the plaque and bacteria from the teeth, if we don't understand the the overall eating habits and drinking habits, uh, we're gonna miss the boat. So the key here is minimally invasive, beneficial remineralization is looking at what's going on with the patient and then taking the various tools in your armamentarium and employing them and seeing which one is going to work best. Is it going to be just Prevident? Is it going to be MI paste? Is it going to be ProBioR? Is it going to be uh, basic bites? Is it going to be just some good teppy brushes in between the teeth every so often? You know, these are the things that you have to look for. And good judgment from every member of the team, from the great hygienists that I have worked with that made me a better doctor than I could have ever been without their help, to my team members, my assistants, my front office staff. Everybody has to be aware and together we can help our patients. But we need to look at and listen to the patients and look at what's going on in there. And there's a lot of things available, a lot of procedures that you can incorporate, a lot of great technology and a lot of great techniques, but understand what's involved. Sometimes the technology is expensive and and not reachable, but sometimes there's some simple things that you can do, like transillumination, like putting in a better oral environment with some of these remineralizing products. They may stem the tide in your favor. And so you do have to take step by step doing that. And hopefully, as, as time goes by, I'll have even more clearer, more concise protocols that I can put together for you and your your audience as we, as we look forward to this. Well, thank you. That would be awesome. So I, I think everyone that is practicing dental hygiene or dentistry, I, I think we all try really hard to do good work. We take the time to get every spicule of calculus off the tooth to make sure the margins and the anatomy is there. Like we work really hard and I don't think anybody wants to see their work crumble. Mm -hmm. And I think the key to that is involving the patient and practicing without a cookbook necessarily and really looking at all the variables. All the ingredients. Yeah. All the ingredients are there. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Agreed. And know how to take a pinch of this and a a little bit of that and put it all together. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Andrew, do you have any questions? I'm good. I think that was... I think I've, really I think I've overwhelmed him. It's a terrible thing to be <laughs> quiet the entire session. That's, <laughs> Andrew's that's how the it is, one doctor. that takes it all in. He sits on it and I'm the chatty Kathy. <laughs> and then I have all my notes yeah. kind of blurred out. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm, I'm the note taker for more questions for the, your next interview with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate this. We appreciate you as a professional and the time you gave us today and our listeners. We really do. It's an absolute pleasure and a joy to be with you both. This is really a lovely thing and so glad to be part of your your podcast. Thank you. So for anyone that wants to be in contact with you, has any more questions, maybe wants to find a a course that you might be teaching, what's the Mm -hmm. best way for them to do that? All the courses that I teach, you can find on my uh, lecture website, which is my first initial and last name, jcamisi.com. 
and that'll tell you where I'm going to be presenting next. Uh, and anybody that wishes to get in touch with me, you can reach me uh, at one of two emails. You can reach me at jcamisi at jcamisi.com or at my university email, which is kamisi at M-U-S-C. Edu. Either of those ways is a great way to get in touch with me. Awesome. And we'll have all that in the show notes for you listeners. But thank you again. And we do so appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, Andrew, very much for this morning. Thank you, Dr. We hope you really enjoyed that. Dr. Kamisi is amazing. Definitely, if you get the opportunity to listen to any of his courses, do that. You won't regret. And we're going to be at Chicago Midwinter when this comes out or That's on right. our way at least. Yeah. So be sure to come find us. We're going to be doing, um, there's an airway thing happening on Wednesday evening. You do have the RSVP to that Thursday. There's the AOSH meeting. You have to RSVP to that, but we'll be at all these little things. So come find us. I'll be at the Tepe booth. So if you are on the floor at the exhibit hall, please come see me. Say hi. I would love to meet you. Andrew, God knows what he'll be doing. Probably I'll be doing a pizza tour on Friday morning at 11 o'clock, yeah. leaving from Paisano's. Just wow. thought I'd throw that out there if anyone wants to do it. ChicagoPizzaTours.com. I wish I had known this because I hate you so much right now. I will be in that very cold exhibit hall. And please send us your messages. We love it. We love your interaction on social media. Check us out on Instagram and Facebook, A Tale of Two Hygienists. You can head over to our website and subscribe to our newsletters that will be coming shortly, A Tale of Two Hygienists.com. And you can also send us an email at A Tale of Two Hygienists at gmail.com. We appreciate you guys. Leave us a review, rate us, check us out on iTunes, all those fun things. Be sure to hit the subscribe button. You're the best. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Bye, y'all.